Coming up, the true story behind the timeless classic. Why Christmas? Why not? See how Charles Dickens changed the holiday season. What is it but an excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December? And go behind the scenes of the new movie, The Man Who Invented Christmas. God bless us, every woman. Plus, children's author Trillia Newbell takes us inside God's very good idea on today's 700 Club. Welcome, folks, to this edition of the 700 Club. We've got a treat for you today, the Grand Illumination at Founders Inn. It's a lovely time. All the little children gathered around. We read the Christmas story. It was really nice. I, it's thank so you. beautiful over there oh, at this time of the year. I mean, when thank you flip that switch, it's like the wonderland comes it just to went, life. <laughs> it was fun. And, you know, you hold it and you hope the thing works. And you, <laughs> I've got this big switch, so we count Shh, down. Don't tell that part. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, and... <laughs> you hit it, and it's, it's illuminating, but it'll be beautiful. We've got it for you today. Well, it's crunch time for Republicans in the Senate. This is the week they hope to pass their crucial tax reform bill, the future of the economy and control of Congress could both hang in the balance of this important day. Well, President Trump is heading to Capitol Hill today to lobby Republican senators personally to finish the bill. Dale Hurd has the story. In Washington, the Christmas rush is on to pass tax reform before the end of the year. But it won't be easy. Will you get this done by Christmas, Senator? I hope so. Some say they better get it done. President Trump's year-end agenda hangs in the balance, as do Republican chances in 2018. We're going to give the American people a huge tax cut for Christmas. Hopefully that will be a great big beautiful Christmas present. But this is primarily about both boosting the economy as well as having a signature accomplishment going into the 2018 elections. The goal is to get the economy growing again, to get people with a little more take-home pay they can spend the way they see fit or save it for their retirement, and to make the United States uh, economy competitive in a global economy. Trump and GOP leaders are scrambling to make changes to the Senate version to woo several Republican holdouts. Republicans have only two votes to spare in the Senate. If just three Republicans oppose it, the bill will fail. We to get to 50. What's the plan Senator, B? You know, Senator, the CBO's we course. intend to get to 50. Mr. Chairman, are you concerned about the major differences between the Senate and House tax plans? No, because we're generally able to get together and, and solve these problems, and I think we will. In a sign that Republicans are preparing to compromise, Senator Rand Paul wrote in an opinion column for Fox News, I'm not getting everything I want, far from it, but I've been immersed in this process. I've fought for and received major changes for the better, and I plan to vote for this bill as it stands right now. Among the holdouts are deficit hawks who worry that tax cuts for businesses and individuals would add to the nation's mounting $20 trillion debt. So the final bill may contain a trigger mechanism to increase taxes if federal deficits start to go up. All this is happening amid a backdrop of more and more members of Congress facing sexual harassment charges. And with Republicans holding such a slim majority in the Senate, President Trump hasn't expressly endorsed embattled Alabama Senate candidate Roy Moore, but he has been attacking his Democratic opponent. But while sexual harassment dominates the headlines, the Senate is focusing on its own priority, hoping to pass a tax reform bill this week so the details can be worked out with the House and the president can sign the bill by the end of the year. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Uh, I hope the senators realize that their future as controlling the government uh, depends on their vote. And if they fail to vote this tax uh, relief through, uh, they will go down. And uh, as somebody said, there will be a whole lot of Uber drivers who are ex-congressmen or ex-senators. <laughs> Uh, I, I think that it's crucial, and they need to recognize it. But there have been some scoring. The liberal groups, I noticed, had shown the economy growing at like 1.9 percent GDP a year, which is way below the historic average. The historic average should be 3, 3.5 percent or even more. And with this tax cut, it will grow. And with that, there will be so much more money 
that the government will be able to pay the bills faster. So it's not a question of, of throwing money away as a question of a stimulus that will bring more revenue. Now they're talking about a trigger. Well, if that doesn't happen, we'll have a trigger in place. But if a trigger is in place, people will say, well, I still can't invest. I can't do what I want to do because uh, it may be that the government will revoke all these tax goodies that they're putting in this bill. So it's going to be a very difficult thing. Well, keeping government spending under control, of course, is one of the key sticking points on, the, on that reform bill. But is Washington doing a good job with the money it already has? One senator is highlighting some expensive mistakes Congress made this year. And our Abigail Robertson brings us that story from Washington. A production of Doggy Hamlet might sound cute, but should federal taxpayers really pay $30,000 for it? Senator James Langford exposes 100 federal fumbles in this report, where he shows how wasteful federal spending costs taxpayers more than $470 billion this year. We identified them, try to be able to put them out and say, how do we fix this? Not just this individual piece, but the bigger piece so we can get on top of our debt and deficit. Among this year's most eye-opening discoveries, an $85 million loan to build a hotel in Kabul, Afghanistan. $2.6 million for research on how stickleback fish adapt to different environments. And $40,000 to study 60 Syrian refugees living in Iceland. Also in the report, examples of government inefficiency and wrongdoing at taxpayers' expense. Case in point, the Defense Department's inability to track down more than a billion dollars worth of equipment purchased for Iraqi security forces. And with all the evidence of wasteful spending, Langford pointed out how damaged houses of worship can't get federal disaster help. FEMA does uh, grants on for disaster uh, for all nonprofits except for houses of worship. So if your church is damaged in a disaster, you can't get federal uh, assistance like other nonprofits can get because FEMA specifically discriminates against houses of worship. Langford says the next challenge is fixing the chaotic budget process. All of these are examples to say this is an example of the problem, but the problem is a bigger issue and it's the process itself and how it comes together. Congress has only stuck to their budget four times in the last 40 years. One of the main causes putting our national debt at over $20 trillion and our 2017 deficit at $666 billion. As Republicans move on tax reform, some lawmakers have expressed concern about what impact tax cuts could have on our national debt and deficit. But Lankford hopes cuts will boost the economy enough to offset the deficit. If you reduce taxes a little bit, not a lot, if you reduce taxes a little bit, it increases the economic health of the nation. That's a positive thing and it offsets. My goal is to say we reduce taxes enough that we can still take care of debt and deficit, uh, but we also can help strengthen the economy. Although many details of the tax plan are still being worked out, Senator Lankford tells me he's confident meaningful tax reform will be in place by January 1st. Reporting from Capitol Hill, Abigail Robertson, CBN News. Well, our CBN News chief political correspondent, David Brody, is with us now. And David, uh, what's the latest uh, you hear from uh, the wrangling over this tax bill? Couple things, Pat. Uh, let's get right to the bottom line here. Uh, two senior staffers telling me this morning in the Senate telling me that it is a 95 chance uh, percentage wise that this bill will come out of the Senate, that it will pass at some point. The question is when exactly? Will it be this week? Will it be next week? I'm hearing 50-50 that the vote will be this week. You know, we've heard for a while that this vote was going to be either Thursday night, possibly on Friday in the Senate. However, on Capitol Hill, President Trump will go up to the Hill to talk to senior staff. He'll actually talk to all senators. And at that point, a determination will be made as to whether or not they need about another week or so uh, until a final vote is held. So we'll see. That's the bottom line. What they're uh, wrangling about. Look, you've got John McCain, Jeff Flake, Bob Corker. These are deficit hawks. They want to see uh, the deficit get under control in this bill. It's not going to happen. It's 1.5 or so trillion over the next decade in terms of the deficit increasing. 
On the other side, you've got Ron Johnson and some other folks, uh, Senator Ron Johnson, who wants a lower corporate tax rate or a lower tax rate, I should say, for pass-through companies. And so you've got the yin and the yang poll. I think the bottom line here, though, Pat, is that most senators here want to get to yes. And as you know how the Senate works, if they want to get to yes, they'll get to yes, especially if they want to save their jobs. Well, I think saving the jobs is the key. What kind yeah. of changes do you think we're going to look for? Uh, well, I think the trigger that we've heard about in Dale's piece, and you mentioned it as well, I mean, that's the key. Tax rates would then have to go up at some point. That's what Corker and Flake and a lot of the deficit hawks want. They want those tax rates to go up. That's the back drop, if you will, or the backstop, uh, I should say, uh, in case uh, the economy doesn't continue to go humming along at about 3% or so. Uh, that's the big wrangle on one side. And then the other part of it is a lower, as I, as I was saying a little bit earlier, a lower rate on those pass-through pass companies. There is a sense that that will happen. We'll know a lot more on that budget committee vote that comes later on Tuesday. If Bob Corker votes no on that, and Ron Johnson is also on that committee, if they're both voting no, that's a major problem for Republicans, and that is not a good sign. That's not expected, though. You know, the whole onus of this thing has been on the Republicans. There must be some Democrats somewhere who think tax cuts are a good thing for their constituents. Have you found any of them anywhere in Washington? Well, they're... Uh, I'm looking around. Not, not really, Pat. No. I mean, Joe Manchin was on the table at one point. It doesn't look like he's going to come around. Heidi Heitkamp as well from uh, North Dakota, not looking like she's coming around either. And those were the two the White House uh, wanted to get. So, no, Democrat votes are tough at this point. Uh, and, you know, part of the reason that Manchin and some other folks might not be on board is that uh, there has been some spin in Democrat circles. Some would say it's not spin, it's facts, that it's going to hurt uh, some of the middle class here. And so that'll be left to economists, and you can have Stephen Moore on to discuss all that. I'll just simply say that Manchin himself uh, is hearing it a little bit there from West Virginia residents uh, who are basically saying, well, wait a minute, is this going to hurt me in the middle class? And so I think he's getting some pushback there, and that's why he's not coming on board. All right. Well, now, back to the uh, one of the, uh, the elephant in the room, so to speak, uh, are these sexual allegations that are taking place. Roy Moore, particularly, I understand the polls down in Alabama are getting very close. What, what do you hear? Well, some of the recent polling is getting closer. But then again, let's be honest, Pat, let's throw all that polling out. I mean, at this point, no one really has any clue how this is going to go down on December 12th. And that's because there's a little bit of that factor where you may not want to admit to a pollster that you're going to vote for Roy Moore. But when that curtain closes, you indeed would vote for Roy Moore. And I think you might have, they call it the anti-Bradley effect, and we won't get into all of that, but you know about Bradley, uh, Tom Bradley, the mayor in Los Angeles and all of that. Anyhow, I, th I think I just got in the weeds. But the point simply is, is that polls are very unreliable at this point. So the question then becomes, will evangelical Christians get out and vote for Roy Moore? Or will they just stay at home? You know, they, there was the same problem or at least conundrum that Republicans had or evangelical Christians had with Donald Trump in 2016. And they said, you know what? We're going to take the macro view. We're not going to take the micro view. And they elected Donald Trump to the presidency of the United States. We'll see what happens with Roy Moore. All right. One last question. In your own uh, personal polling, what, oh, what no. do you give the odds of this bill passing? Oh, are you talking about tax reform, Pat? Yeah, right. Tax reform. 99% because ultimately it's all about preservation up here in Washington, D.C. As you said, uh, safety of the majority, because let's face it, in 2018, if you're going to go to voters and say, well, you know what, we didn't pass Obamacare or repeal of that. And oh, by the way, we didn't pass tax reform either. Well, that's game, set, match. You can crown, uh, <laughs> you can crown Chuck Schumer majority leader at this point. You might as well just write that in. That's what will go down in 2018. So they've got to pass tax reform. Form. And so ultimately, it is about self-preservation. I think these guys get it done, these women and men get it done in the Senate. David, I concur heartily, and I believe it's the truth. Self-preservation, they've got to know about it. Hey, Terry, you've got a story now about about the man who established Christmas. Tell us about it. I will. Coming up, Christopher Plummer talks about his role as Ebenezer Scrooge. It's a classic character, obviously. So I just have one more to chalk up on my career as a classical actor. See our sneak peek behind the scenes of the man who invented Christmas after this.
Hey, welcome back. You're watching the 700 Club. We're getting closer and closer to Christmas. We're surrounded by Christmas trees, poinsettias, and all this finery. It's kind of a fun season because everything is beautiful. It really is. Yeah. And it, it, I, I think it's very uplifting. You it know, is. I, it is. Yes, this is beautiful. We've got an amazing team here who. They do a fantastic does a job. job. Well, in any event, the holiday movie season is underway. And this year, it includes a new take on an old favorite. The Man Who Invented Christmas is based on the inspiring true story of how Charles Dickens wrote a Christmas Carol. Ephraim Graham brings us that story. Then a toast, my love, my dearies, to our Merry Christmas. God bless us. God bless us. God bless us, everyone. Dickens' A Christmas Carol has been told time and time again, on stage and on screen. The interesting thing is it's on surface, it's all fun and roaring fires and horse chestnuts and, and snow and dancers and blind man's buff, but the genius of Dickens is that he transcends all that and it's really about being a human being and finding out what it is to be a human being and how you can share the world a little bit. And I think that's why it resonates, that's why still that, that, that book gets sold in its millions around the world. Now moviegoers get the story behind the classic tale in The Man Who Invented Christmas. Based on Les Standiford's book, the movie introduces viewers to 32-year-old Charles Dickens, who wrote the literary classic in just six weeks, all in an effort to keep creditors at bay. Why Christmas? Why not? Does anybody really celebrate it anymore, apart from our clerk? The film is set in Victorian England, a time when Christmas had become unpopular. What we mean to say, Mr. Dickens, is not much of a market for Christmas books, what? It is a Christmas book because Christmas is, or ought to be, the one time of year when men and women open their shut-up hearts and think of the people below them as if they really were fellow passengers to the grave and not another race of creatures altogether. Dan Stevens plays Dickens. He's best known for his breakout role as Matthew Crawley in Downton Abbey and playing the Beast in Disney's live version of Beauty and the Beast. We are already halfway through October. Even if you'd already written it, we couldn't possibly get it illustrated, typeset printed and bound, advertised and distributed to shops in only six weeks. Were you familiar with the story behind the Christmas story? I mean, the, the fact that his life was so interplayed in it and the deadline and all of that? I actually went and, and really mined, there's a great uh, annotated edition of Christmas Carol um, with a fantastic introduction by a scholar called Michael Hearn who, who lives here in New York. and. Uh, there was some amazing details, you know, little detail about his relationship with Forster and accounts from his daughter's diaries about finding her dad making these weird faces in the mirror and conjuring these characters, and he really had to make them vivid and alive. Humbug. What is? Christmas. Huh. What about it? Well, I mean, what is it but an excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December? Peter, yeah, keep going. A time for paying bills without money. A time for finding yourself a year older and not an hour richer. Veteran actor Christopher Plummer plays Dickens' vision of the iconic Ebenezer Scrooge. It was a, a double. We did bits of Scrooge and bits of whoever this guy was. The Academy Award winner adds this latest role to his more than 50-year career. It's a classic character, obviously, and I'm used to classic characters, so I'm just having one more to chalk up on my career as a classical actor. Did you approach this as an adventure story in terms of how you wanted it told? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it is an adventure story. It, it's, it's a, you know, I, people always forget it's a bit of science fiction. You know, it's a man who goes back and it's back to the future. It's a man who goes <laughs> back in time and meets himself and becomes a better person for it. And it's just, it was the first time it was ever done. 1843. I mean, no one had done it before. Even yeah. the time machine hadn't been written by H.U. And no one had even had that. And so for me, it's a great rollicking adventure. That's, I, it always has. Merry, Merry Christmas to one and all. Ephraim Graham, CBN News, New York. Back to work. 
God bless us, everyone. Well, we're thanks to Dickens for his work. Well, for many families, there's a holiday tradition that happens right here on our CBN campus, the Sunday after Thanksgiving. It's the annual grand illumination at the Founders Inn. Here's a look at some of this year's highlights of this magnificent ceremony. Christmas time is here, and it's time for one of Virginia Beach's favorite traditions, the grand illumination at Founders Inn. We're celebrating the illumination. Of Jesus' birthday. Of Jesus' birthday, all right. There was music from local youth choirs, aerial performers, cultural dances, plus jugglers, stilt walkers, and puppeteers. For the kids, there was face painting, balloon animals, and even a visit from Santa. Many took in the sights from a ride in a horse-drawn carriage. Under the four-story Christmas tree, Pat Robertson read the story of Jesus' birth. One baby, one little baby was the way God changed the course of the world. One little baby. And then children, young and old, gathered outside for the big moment. We're here now for the grand illumination. Three, two, one. With 100,000 dazzling lights, the Founders Inn is a true Christmas wonderland. Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas! Well, we didn't need Dickens for that. <laughs> it, was just, it was beautiful, Terry. It's all those little always. children, we had a Wonderful. great time. Well, it's a great family evening, yeah. a great way to usher in the holiday season after Thanksgiving. I want to mention there are still some amazing events that are to happen at the Founders Inn and Spa yeah. here in Virginia Beach that I think your family might really enjoy. The young ones would enjoy a teddy bear tea. I, it, that is so charming, and it's done so well. A Santa slumber party or breakfast with Santa, and then the whole family can celebrate this. There's a Christmas Eve dinner buffet or a Christmas Day brunch, and everything is always so beautifully presented Fantastic. over there. I know that you would really enjoy it. You can dance the night away as well if you would like it with the red carpet New Year's Eve gala, so you might want to be a part of that if you're looking for a special place to usher in the new year. All you have to do is go to CBN.com if you'd like to get times and dates for these and more. All the upcoming holiday events are listed there, and I think you would thoroughly enjoy and have your uh, your whole holiday enhanced by taking advantage well, of some just, of these. You know, Thanksgiving was huge. They had about 1,900 people. I know. <laughs> I mean, it was just huge. Uh, all those people were enjoying turkey and the trimmings for Thanksgiving. And one lady said, well, I took four more people, and we're going to make it a and many couples are making it a tradition. That's what I was going to say. I tradition. think there are people who come year after year, bring their children and then their grandchildren. Yeah. And so it's been, it's become quite the place to be. Well, the, the grand illumination, the, the ball, I mean, the uh, atrium was just packed with children. We had a wonderful time. I read the Christmas story to them. And, and then we went up uh, to the balcony and, and turned the switch. And that, the whole garden just came alive. It was beautiful. It is. Okay. It is. Well, up next, a couple gets a wake-up call at tax time. The accountant asked us, I've got all of your documents, but I did not receive your charitable contribution statements. That was embarrassing. That was kind of an awakening. I don't want this to ever happen again. See what happens next after this. Well, we're here at the 700 Club, and we're celebrating the holiday season. It's wonderful. I hope it's a blessing to you and your home. Well, Sabrina and Bruce were never on the same page about money. For Sabrina, it was all about security. And for Bruce, total control was the key. And one day, at tax time, their eyes were suddenly opened, and this married couple finally became a team. When Bruce and Sabrina Blay married, they brought different expectations about money to the altar. 
It was a second marriage for both, and Sabrina had struggled for several years as a single mother. I grew up very poor. So I saw what money was. Security was a big deal for me. Bruce came from a poor background too. The struggles he experienced led to a firm resolution about money in the future. Uh, I just wanted to have enough. I wouldn't ever put myself in a position where a bill wasn't paid. I was very in control, so I was very protective of the funding. The new husband and wife both had jobs that paid well, so Bruce decided they would handle their finances separately. I should feel the security, right, because the bills are being paid, but I felt like none of it was mine. I was too stubborn and I was too scared and I was just too much in control. When the Blaze were doing their taxes together, they were ashamed by what they discovered. The accountant asked us, I've got all of your documents, but I did not receive your charitable contribution statements. It was embarrassing. Felt bad that I had disappointed God. That was kind of an awakening. And that was like, I don't want this to ever happen again. Sabrina and Bruce were Christians. They knew about tithing, but they never put it into practice. I didn't own that for my life. I made up my own rules. So I was serving the world by keeping my money separate from my faith. Unfortunately, a reflection of my relationship with Christ. I can trust you with everything but this. Armed with a new conviction, Bruce and Sabrina began to tithe faithfully. I felt like we're finally on the same team. We have the same goal. During that period, Sabrina heard about CBN. They decided to become members. Whenever they were talking about Superbook, I kept thinking the difference it's making in children. It's amazing. A cartoon is changing lives eternally. I was uh, paying a lot of attention to how they were helping people that were desperate. And, and I could just feel the commitment that the people at CBN have to save people. It overwhelmed me. After faithfully tithing for several months, Sabrina and Bruce say they saw unexpected changes in their finances. An opportunity started opening up for me to be a part of the management team in a, in a leadership role. And I don't understand how this has happened. And she would say, do you think it's God? And I would say, well, I do now. And the Braves decided to increase their pledge to CBN. That was a proud moment for me because him wanting to part with money, I knew what it took for him to arrive to that decision. Since then, the Blaze have increased their giving to CBN again. Bruce received another promotion and closed a million dollar sales deal. And their combined income has increased by 33%. I think it's a direct result from giving. I think him yielding to the money with the Lord and to me, I think has opened the floodgates. It used to be about money. Now it's about my relationship with the Lord. I've learned to trust completely. The treasures that God has for you are available to you through obedience to the Word. You will not be able to help bless God. Well, ladies and gentlemen, around the nation, today is a special day. It is called Give Back Tuesday. It's Give Back Time. And what people are encouraged to do, uh, this is the... Uh, uh, well, it's the time when you do something special. And uh, I, I'm just thrilled that people will do that, that, that there's going to be a matching for everything you give on this particular day. And I want you to have Ask Anything. This is a series of answers to your questions. And I just finished doing something with Scott Ross in our studio yesterday that I think will be a blessing. It has, it's how to have your prayers answered. And we, we went into detail about the things to do to get prayers answered, the hindrances to prayer, and uh, we have some examples of wonderful answers to prayer that God has given, and we think that'll be a thrill for you. We'll tell you more about that when you join Pledge Express. But this right now, ask anything, the answers to your questions uh, when you join the 700 Club. And what, is it, what are we talking about? 65 cents a day. Just a little pocket change, 65 cents a day. But if everybody participates all at the same time, 
the amount of money is just wonderful, and we can do things that you just wouldn't believe because we are very efficient with the money that comes to us here at CBN. Very, very efficient. Terry? Yeah. Well, when you give to the 700 Club, I want you to know you're helping people all over the world. People like Sando and her mother, they live in South Africa. Their family was so poor, they were always hungry. So to fill themselves up, they drank lots and lots of river water. And then one day, Thando became very sick, and her mother feared that she actually might die. Every day, Thando and her mom, Monica, walk down to the river to fetch water. Sometimes they go to the river because they have nothing to eat. There were times we drank the river water just to make our hunger go away. Thando got very skinny and it races all over her body. I felt terrible. I looked everywhere for work. People said they would get back to me, but they never did. Neither Monica nor her husband could find steady work, so the whole family was malnourished. One morning, Monica found Thondo in bed, very sick. Fear felt me. I thought she was going to die. I cried out to God, wondering if he saw us suffer. I knew he could give us a normal life. I just had to put my trust in him. Desperate to find help, Monica reached out to Crossroads, a ministry supported by CBN's Orphan's Promise. We immediately helped Thondo get treated for her rashes and malnourishment. Soon she was healthy again. Now she's one of 75 children enrolled in our daycare program in the area. Here she has two meals a day, clean water, and friends. I love the food. I want to come to school every day, even on Sundays. There are so many toys here. I can't decide which ones to play with first. I'm so happy because I know she's being taken care of. People there treat her like she's their own. We helped Fondo's dad get a job as a truck driver, and we helped Monica find work too. Together, Monica and her husband can now provide for their family. Thank you so much for what you have done for us. I pray that you will continue to do the same for others. Thank you, CBN. She's precious, isn't she? And you know, she could have died from that river water. It happens to children around the world every day. But you made a difference there. Isn't it wonderful to know that after celebrating Thanksgiving and thanking God for all of the blessings that we have, that he gives us this opportunity to give back, to make a difference. This is a global day, this Give Back Tuesday. It's ded dedicated to us being able to say not just thank you, but let me make a difference in the life of someone else. So through the end of today, CBN partners are willing to match your gift dollar for dollar as part of Give Back Tuesday. That means everything you give gets doubled. So this is your opportunity to give back as a way to say thank you for the many blessings that you enjoy and an opportunity for you to make your giving go twice as far. How do you do that? Well, you do it by calling our toll-free number. It's 1-800-700-7000. That's one 800 800 700 7000. Just tell us what you'd like to give, or you can log on to CBN.com and do it that way. But give back today. It'll make your holiday so much more special, and it'll allow us to do even more in the name of Jesus and with gratitude toward you. So call now. Well, still ahead, we've got your email. Jean says, Is it okay to use healing crystals? Your questions, honest answers, that's all coming up. <laughs> And welcome back to the 700 Club. ISIS appears to be threatening a terrorist attack in New York City at Christmas time. The London Daily Mail reports the terrorist group posted a photo of Santa Claus looking at shoppers in Times Square as he's standing next to a box of dynamite. It includes the words, we meet at Christmas in New York soon. The paper adds terrorists have been using encrypted communications channels to share pictures of holiday scenes in Europe with images of jihadists and blood superimposed on them. A memorial service is being held today for gospel singer and pastor Sean Jones. Jones collapsed and died during a performance with his band recently in Pensacola, Florida. The Christian Post reported Jones passed out on stage shortly after he began singing, Worthy is He.
Some at the concert believe he had suffered a heart attack. The 32-year-old husband and father of three led the gospel quartet, Sean Jones and the Believers. It was known for hits like I'm Depending on You. The band's old-fashioned sound was a staple in many Southern, Southern Christian homes. Jones was the founding pastor of the New Thing Empowerment Church in Auburn, Alabama. You can find out more about Sean Jones's life and ministry, including how he reached people from all walks of life. And you can always get the latest from CBN News by visiting our website at CBNNews.com. We'll be back with much more of The 700 Club coming up right after this. Time for your questions and some honest answers. And Pat, this first one comes from Jean, who says, is it okay to use healing crystals? I don't want to do anything against God. I just wondered if the Bible says it's okay or not. I don't recall the Bible talking about crystals at all, but crystals is now part of the new age, and mm -hmm. they have all kinds of uh, ceremonies around crystals. Uh, a crystal as such is something that's in the natural world and it's very beautiful. But uh, I think using them for healing, I think is wrong. That's my, you ask my opinion, that's my opinion. Mm -hmm. This is Donna who says, I've been approached in public places many times and asked for money by strangers. I'm an elderly widow living on a fixed income and I want to do the Christian thing. I would like to know if there should be some discernment about this or should I just give 10 or $20 every time someone asks for it? Uh, don't do it. You know, there are a bunch of drunks around uh, who give you the sob story about how they've got to get, I mean, in New, New York, it was always, I've got to get across the river to Jersey, and my family's over there. Would you please give me, you know, $20 or $10? Yes, right. Or I, I need a meal. And I remember one, I said, okay, you want a meal? I'll take you to the automat. We'll go right now, and I'll buy you lunch. They didn't want lunch. They wanted a drink, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. But, I mean, you've got to, you, you can't, you're just uh, uh, enabling some terrible habit. You don't need to be, feel bad about that. It's just people panhandling around cities, particularly their, their budget con men. It's just, I'm, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is Larry who says, I was taught that we must earn our place in heaven. Other Christians, like the evangelicals, teach that we have grace through the death of Jesus. If we have grace because Jesus died for us, then what in the Bible compels us to do good deeds since we already have grace? On the other hand, if we have to live the, quote, good life to stay in the grace of God, then how is that different from the teaching that we have to continue to do good to go to heaven? Um, like the fellow said, you're too smart, but in by half. You've got, you've got too many things going on. Uh, we are saved by faith, by grace through faith, and that's not of ourselves. It is the gift of God. Grace is given. It is, it is unmerited favor, and we are saved because of the work of Jesus, not because of any works of righteousness. There's nothing you can do to earn heaven. Nothing, nothing. It's been done by Jesus. Okay. Now I am washed in the blood. I am a full-fledged member of the family of God. Now, as a son of God, how should I live? Well, I should live by helping others because I am now a child of God, and I'm his representative on earth, and I'm going to do what God would have me do. That's not going to earn heaven, but it's, it's what I should do as a child of God. Is that clear enough? Yes. All right, let's get the next one. <laughs> okay, this is David who says, I am depressed. I am a Christian, yet I'm having doubts because my depression's going on nine months. I dread waking up to face the day. I'm married, 60, retired, and have little to do each day. I'm bored with few skills. I'm surprised I made it this far in life. My wife is much stronger in her faith than I am. My self-esteem has never been so low. I need a miracle from God. I think about death more than living. Why is has God not heard my prayers, and why do I want to give up? Well, uh, what you're doing is absolutely the wrong thing. Instead of facing life and enjoying life, get out and start walking, and then start jogging and start running. Go to the gym and work out. Begin to look after your diet, and then go help somebody else. 
you're always concerned about yourself, and that will lead to depression. And if you do not exercise and you do not eat properly, you will have depression. So you are doing everything that will hurt you, and then you're asking why God doesn't change things. Change the way you're living, your lifestyle. And, the, you know, they talk about, you know, rusting out. You know, the idea of retiring somebody at 60 is just insane because people have a lot of energy, and they want to be creative, and they want to help people. I mean, we are made to work. We aren't made to sit around and, and moan. And you're sitting around and moaning. Of course you feel bad. Get up and get going and watch what happens. All right. This is Diane who says, My ex-husband passed away eight years ago, and I have been living with a divorced man for seven years. I am financially dependent on this man now, and I'm not physically able to work as I used to. My spirit has never been able to justify this relationship. I'm 54 and feel as though God may not be answering my prayers to help me move away from my living situation to a more godly one. How do I do this in my financial dependency? Will God direct me out of this situation? I understand while living in sin, I'm blocking my life from God's plans for me. You're not kidding you, are you? are only 54. I mean, look, I'm 87. You're 54 and I'm still going. Why can't you go? I mean, 54 is nothing. You're just a child. Well, she says she's financially dependent. I don't on care you. what she says, but she's, she can go get a job. You can, you're, you're an able-bodied person at 54. You're not, uh, you know, 80 or 90 or ready for the, uh, the old folks' home. You're an active, uh, you've got a life ahead of you. The idea is you are living in sin with somebody, and you know it's wrong. This guy is, I don't know whether he's married or what he's divorced, whatever. He's divorced. But whatever. You're doing something that's wrong, and you know it's wrong. And you're doing it every day. So, you know, leave. You just got to make a decision. I will take charge of my life. I'm going to leave him because it's wrong. Then I'm going to get involved in something that is good. And I will use my life to the glory of God for these next days. I've got maybe 20, 25 years left ahead of you. So enjoy these days because they're precious. But don't fritter them away worrying about the fact you're sinning. Yes, you're sinning. Stop it. All right? <laughs> Oh, Good word. Okay. Good word. Thank you for your questions. Well, up next, meet a former pro-choice feminist. Hear how her life was radically changed and see how she's now teaching children of the beauty of diversity. Let me just say, Merry Christmas. It's that time of the year. Well, Trillian Newbell once thought that children were expendable and that they would just get in the way of her dreams. But today, Trillia is a mom herself, and she's living her dream, teaching children about the beauty of diversity. Trillia Newbell is a bridge builder. She wants to combat racial division by changing the next generation. She believes it's a biblical mandate. If we're gonna teach them about all these various things that are so good in God's Word, then we should also teach them about creation as it relates to people, people made in the image of God who are uniquely different. In her new book, God's Very Good Idea, Trillia helps children see how people from all ethnic and social backgrounds are valuable to God and how Jesus came to rescue all of us. Please welcome to the 700 Club, Trillia Newbell. Thank you. You have come a long way. You were a pro-choice, a pro-choice feminist before. What changed? The gospel. <laughs> That'll do it. Yes, I had a friend share the gospel with me and my life was transformed. My heart was transformed. My thinking was transformed. And God, he, he took a dead, spiritually dead woman and gave her resurrection life. So the Lord just saved me by His gospel and His grace. And we're supposed to be changed when that happens, aren't we? Absolutely. So he, here you had been thinking before that children were expendable because you had dreams and goals and hopes and things you wanted to do yes. and they were gonna get in the way, but I'm holding your children's book. Yes. That's a very good idea. Tell me how you came to this place. Sure. Well, I, 
I was asked to teach a Sunday school class about diversity. And when I was teaching it, I was looking for resources and I couldn't find anything. And the Lord, it, it was just amazing. The children and their responses, I just thought, this, this message needs to be out broader. Yes. More people need to hear God's very good idea to create people made in His image, all different, unique, and that we all need saving grace through the finished work of Jesus Christ, and that we can worship together, and we will be worshiping together forever for eternity. Those so. two those two thoughts really come together in your book, but they really come together in the gospel message to all of us. Absolutely. I often think about how much fun God must have had making us all because we're all created so differently. We are. How did you see children react to that message? Well. It, one, I remember um, one of my daughter's friends um, telling her parents that my daughter, Sydney, wasn't just her friend, yeah. it's her sister. Mm. And that to me is such, it was so, it, it, it was so motivating. I knew if a child can get it, then we should get it too. And a child needs to understand that she's created by God mm. to glorify Him, to rejoice in Him, and that God created all different people from every tribe, tongue, and nation, yes. ultimately for His glory, yeah. but also for our good, yes. so that we can know one another, and we can only love one another truly through Jesus. In Ephesians 2, it talks about that God, Jesus, tore the veil of hostility yes. through His body, making one new man, so we can have you, unity through the gospel. It's yeah. the reality yeah. of what Jesus has accomplished. You know, Pat and I were just talking about that, about the power of unity that God says when we, when we work for it, when we want it, when we reach out for it, that it commands a blessing from Him. And what a, what a word in the world that we live in today. What are some ways that parents, in addition to getting the book and reading the story to children, what are some ways that parents can celebrate diversity with their kids? Well, one really simple way is having diversity in your home. Yes. So having a, your table look diverse, mm -hmm. inviting people who you don't know, who are different than you, inviting people who look sound, um, have different abilities, socioeconomic as well, to your table. One of the, so proximity changes everything. Yes. When children can see and talk to those who are different, it will transform the way they view and how they love one another. Yeah. Yeah. And this is a great season of the year to be contemplating that, isn't it? Because it's a season where we entertain in our home. The doors yes. are open. The so doors are open. What a great, what a great time to do that. Absolutely. And I think it's it's really not just an opportunity, it's a responsibility that we have to give our children that. It time. is. And it's our mission. Yes. Jesus told the 12 disciples to go and make disciples of all nations. That wasn't just for them, that's for us too. We are to go out and we will forever be worshiping yeah. with a diverse people. Hand in hand, hand arm in arm. Hand, arm in yes. arm. Let's do it today. Yes. And so that's my hope is that we know the gospel, that the gospel transforms hearts and that the gospel can transform our relationships. God's very good idea. What a great gift to give to the children in your life. It's available wherever books are sold. We have a social exclusive interview with Trillia on our Facebook page. Watch that by going to facebook.com slash 700 club. Thank you. It's a great book. Thank Love you. It. Thank you. Pat. Well, thank you very much. We're so glad that each one of you have been with us today. We've got a tremendous program tomorrow. A very interesting guest. You won't believe what she went through to find the Lord. We leave you with these words from 1 Peter, and above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. So that's all the time we've got. This is Pat Robertson. For all of us, we'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.